Welcome to The Journey Online. Today we'll have a great and inspiring service. We also want to share this exciting news. Construction on our new church building has begun. It's a prayer come true. <laughs>
y'all just bow your head in prayer with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for, for you and for your son and for your word. Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity for us to know the truth because it's written straight from you. I thank you for the so many, the different avenues that we have to, to hear that truth, whether that be from the Bible itself or from family, from friends, or from Pastor KP. Lord, I ask that you just bless today, and you bless the people watching this sermon today. I ask that you just please take these tithes and offerings and make them be not just what we need, but more than what we need. Help us use this money to reach people in the community, people who don't know you, who don't know that truth. I ask that you just give us that ability to do your work. In your name we pray. Amen. Welcome and good morning. I'm Ken Pasno, and I'm honored to have been invited to fill in for Pastor KP this morning and bring you today's message. I'd like to welcome any visitors that are joining us virtually, and welcome to the Journey United Methodist Church online worship service. We are so happy that you're here joining us this morning. Let's begin where we always begin, and that's with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we humbly ask that you will Fill us with your knowledge this morning, that you will open our hearts, our minds, and our souls to be receptive to your word. We ask that in your gentleness that you guide us, in your power that you strengthen us, in your holiness have mercy on us, and as our shepherd, feed us from your word this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, I want to talk to you about how we react to storms that we face in life. You know, those times when when everything just seems to go against you, and no matter what you do or don't do, there just doesn't seem to be anything you can do to regain control of the situation. As long as life's going the way you want it to go, well, we feel as if we're in control, and that gives us a great sense of security. We're comfortable. We're relaxed. We can sleep. In fact, we work very hard all of our lives to be in control. Unfortunately, that feeling of control gives us a false sense of security. The problem is, being in control of life, (laughs) that's just a myth. No one can truly be in control of life. Come on, think about it. We can't control whether we believe, breathe or not, or whether our heart beats or not. We can't even control our children as they grow. And controlling our spouse? I mean, that's out of the question. My wife Jane, she tells me that all the time. All it takes is one storm to show us that we are not in control. That's exactly what the disciples are about to find out in today's story. So if you have your Bibles, you can follow along. We're going to be looking at Mark's Gospel, the fourth chapter, verses 35 through 41. I'll have it up here behind me in case you don't have your Bibles handy. This is where the disciples face their very first major storm, both physically and spiritually. Up until now, the disciples have been observers of Jesus and not participants in his work. They've listened to Jesus teach about the kingdom of God. They've watched him heal the sick and drive out demons. And so far, no demand has been placed on them. But all of that's about to change. You see, Jesus doesn't allow us to remain spectators. He demands that we make decisions about him, that we commit ourselves to him. As we look at today's scripture, 
I want to point out a couple of important aspects of facing the storms of life. Now, first, Jesus directs his disciples to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. I've got the picture here just to show you. You can follow the arrow. They're going to go across the Sea of Galilee. So we begin at verse 35, where it says, That day, when evening came, he, being Jesus, said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Jesus sent, has spent a long day teaching in parables to a very large crowd of people. Many wanted to touch him and be healed by him. So for his own safety, he had to get in a boat and go just off the shore so he could teach. By the end of the day, Jesus was exhausted. But the people, well, they refused to leave. So Jesus tells his disciples to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And that's exactly what they do. See, leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. Now, to their credit, the disciples respond immediately. They don't try to go ashore and get supplies or personal items. They simply set sail for the other side of the Sea of Galilee. However, while they're crossing the sea, perhaps just as dusk is turning into darkness, verse 37 tells us that a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so it was nearly swamped. The Sea of Galilee is located in a valley some 700 feet below sea level. There are hills and mountains on both sides that form well, kind of a wind tunnel effect that can create sudden gale force winds on the Sea of Galilee. And for anyone caught on the water when this happens, it's like riding a bucking bronc with no way to get off. And this was one of those times for these disciples. While sailing across the Sea of Galilee, the disciples find themselves in the middle of a sudden and violent storm. But why did these men done wrong that they ended up in a storm like this? Well, the answer is absolutely nothing. They did nothing wrong. Now, we all know that we can bring storms on ourselves. But not every storm we face comes because we did something wrong. Often we end up in storms because, well, we're obeying Jesus. Just as it was with his disciples on this particular night. In the same way, when we're faithfully following and obeying him, we're going to face some pretty violent storms in life. The good news is, no storm, no matter how big or small, surprises Jesus or unnerves him. He knows every storm we'll ever face in life. Unfortunately, when Jesus leads us into storms, we may not find him as responsive as what we would like. It may seem as though, well, like he doesn't care about the storm that we're facing. Just look what happens next to the disciples. In verse 38, Jesus was in the stern, in the back, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Their situation was desperate. There's no doubt. The waves were literally crashing in on them. Their boat was nearly capsized and swamped. These men, fishermen and landlubbers alike, were overwhelmed by the severity of this storm. They were wet, cold, and frightened as their little boat was tossed about. They desperately needed help in the storm. And where was Jesus? Well, he was sound asleep in the back of the boat. So what do his disciples do? Well, the, the very same thing that we do in life storms hit us. They turned on him and they accused him. Don't you care if we drown? Of course, if they drown, so does he. Common sense alone would tell him that he cares. And common sense would tell us the same thing. The idea that Jesus, who died for us, wouldn't care about us, about our pain, or anxiety, or our fear, well, it makes no sense at all. Yet this is the feeling many of us have. And we may feel this way simply because there's a storm. Because we believe we're not supposed to have storms in life. As believers in Jesus, we often believe that we're supposed to somehow be protected from the storms, struggles, and problems in life. And that's why we respond with such anger and resentment when the storm comes. We see Jesus asleep in the back of the boat and we're angry at him thinking that, well, he just doesn't care. And if the disciples, well, if they're anything like me, they're working hard to save themselves rather than turn to Jesus in their time of need. They probably tried to, to turn the sail in order to catch the wind and outrun the storm. 
They probably tried to, to roll through the waves when that didn't work. And they must have tried to bail out the boat and the waves nearly swamped them. They did everything they could to save themselves with Jesus right there in the boat with them. This is exactly what we do in so many of life's storms. We respond by trying to gain control of the storm. But life is too big to be controlled by us. And while we're struggling to be in control, well, Jesus is right with us. But we don't turn to him and ask for his help. And so the storm continues. And we reach the point of terror in the storm. And then we become angry with him. We also need to understand that although they knew about Jesus, well, they still didn't know Jesus on a personal level. We see this in the accusatory question they ask him. Don't you care if we drown? In other words, what they're saying is, how can you sleep at a time like this? Aren't you going to help us trim the sails or row the boat or bail out the water? You need to get up and do your part. They had heard the words and seen the works of Jesus, but his words and deeds were mere theory to them. The idea that he could actually do something about the storm, well, that never occurred to them. The reason for this is because they assumed that they had to do something. They had to save themselves. The belief that they had to handle the issues and stresses of life on their own was so ingrained in them that they could only see their own struggle and their own terror. And we tend to do the exact same thing. Many times we see the teachings of Jesus as just theory, not living truth. And we think that whether we survive the storms of life or not, well, it's up to us. That Jesus is just, well, a sleeping theory in the back of the boat. But Jesus doesn't see things quite that way. Look at verse 39. He got up, rebuked the storm, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. Now this is amazing. Jesus rebukes the storm, and the seas become completely calm. The storm is now over, and their knowledge about Jesus suddenly changes. They now know him as their savior because of the storm. Their belief in him becomes very real and personal. And then after rebuking the storm, Jesus turns to his disciples and rebukes them for their cowardice and lack of faith. In verse 40, he says to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? See, notice how Jesus asks them why they're afraid. It's a rhetorical question. Then he answers the question for them. He tells them that it's because of their lack of faith. He's reminding them that that they've heard him teach. They've seen him heal the sick, the blind, the crippled. And they've watched him set the demon-possessed free. In other words, he's carefully sown the seeds of faith in them. Then, through his teaching and healing, he's continued to nurture it as it took root and began to grow in each of them. And now it's time for their faith to start producing fruit. In the same way, we can come to worship week after week and learn about Jesus, both his words and his works. Yet somehow our faith doesn't grow. We hear about Jesus, but we don't experience him. We still act like it's up to us to control what happens in our lives. That we have the wisdom and the strength to control the storms of life. And when we fail, and on our own, we will always fail. We cry out in anger and blame him for not caring about us. We know about Jesus, but we don't know him personally. Now, how do you suppose the disciples reacted to what Jesus had just done? When the disciples saw that Jesus could calm the storm simply by rebuking it, they were amazed and terrified at his authority. Look at verse 41. They were terrified and they asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Mark, once again, uses the same Greek word for terrified that he used earlier in the scriptures. See, earlier it was used to reflect the disciples' fear and their cowardice because they were overwhelmed by the storm. But in the context of this statement, it means that they were afraid, but not in a cowardly sense. Here they're terrified because they're overwhelmed by the holy presence of God. From the teaching they've received all their lives. See, they knew only God could do what Jesus just did. Only the Creator could control nature like that. They were overwhelmed by the sudden realization that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah, 
the very Son of God, and that he could calm all of life's storms, physically and spiritually. When we come to that same realization, we too will move from trying to control our storms to trusting in our beloved Savior. I love the way Beth Moore said this one time. She said, we want Jesus to hurry up and calm the storm. He wants us to find him in the midst of it first. Think about that. See, we want Jesus to hurry up and calm the storms. Jesus, I shouldn't have to suffer in life. But he wants us to find him in the midst of a storm first to turn to him. The moral of this story is that God is here in the boat with us. God is involved in our lives. And he is the creator of all, the Lord of all, the sovereign of all, the controller of all. So we can indeed trust in him to calm whatever storms we may face in life. So whenever you face a storm in life, don't automatically try to control it on your own. Rather, look to Jesus and rely on his strength and let him comfort you in your time of need. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you so much for these wonderful words that you have preserved over time for our hearing today. Let these words and your message humble us. Let it provide us with the wisdom we need to face those storms in life. That we won't try to face them alone by ourselves, leaving you in the back of the boat. But that we would first turn to you, find you in the storm, seek your help, your guidance, and your protection with a full assurance that you will indeed calm our storms. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.
everybody. Pastor KP here at the construction site. Thanks for joining us today for the journey online. Thanks everybody who helped make the video, sing the songs, um, yeah, and the outdoor service and all that. We couldn't do it. Like it's, It takes a team to be the journey. Amen. Thanks to Ken Pasno for giving us a good message today. Um, he's a good man. He's been a good, great supporter of, of me since I've been here. And thank God for him and for all of you. And for all of you so here we are at the building the new building there's a guy over there putting in a water meter that's kind of cool the plumbing is in for the slab for the uh, the drain pipes and they're putting the steel in right now so they're getting ready to pour I'll try to get a hold of the builder and find out exactly when we're gonna pour the slab and kind of like what kind of day they might think they'd be they might be finishing this thing yeah so we thank God that all these things are happening right now. Even though this is a crazy time, there's still a lot of stability in all this that we're moving forward in, a, in an amazing way, and we're just thankful. So, um, yeah, have a good week. Have a good life. If you need anything, call me, KP, 830-358-8708. Anytime, man, I'm here for you. All right, receive this benediction. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, have a good week. Amen.